Welcome to Art After Dark and also welcome to the North Museum of Art. Uh, my name is Tierra Lovu and I'm Curatorial Research Associate here at the Norton um, and the curator of Lala Asadi Unveiled. Over the next hour that we have together, um, I'll be leading a discussion um, into the work of Lala Asadi and I believe at the end we'll have some time for question and answer. But before we begin, I'd like to thank the entire team that assisted with the show, uh, with a special shout out to Pamela Solaris for her contributions as we delved in to the beautiful oeuvre that is Lala Asadi's uh, career. And for those in the audience uh, who may not have had the chance to walk through the gallery, this exhibition gathers over 10 years of Asadi's photography, starting at the beginning of her professional career after she graduated with her MFA in 2003. And the latest work we have on view is from 2017. And over that time period, Asadi completed numerous series, with the four most major ones being Converging Territories, La Femme du Maroc, Harem, and Bullets, all of which are represented in the show. And so while Saltzman Gallery is a more intimate, special exhibition space, there is undeniably great depth waiting for you through this grouping. Um, so before diving into the exhibition, I did want to share um, some works by women artists that may be familiar to some of you in the audience, just to better contextualize um, Asadi's conceptual approach to photography. Asadi's work is not only visually layered, as you'll see, uh, in the fabrics that she often drapes on her sitters, but it's also layered with cultural metaphors. Um, so while this first part may feel a little bit like Art History 101, I promise it'll all come together. And that's an exhibition, um, an installation shot of the exhibition. So starting first uh, with a work that's on view actually in Fisher Gallery um, is this piece by McElaine Thomas. And through her large scale collage works, McElaine Thomas explores what beauty means for black women. And she does so by revisiting moments of art history. Here she recalls the reclining pose that was popularized by a movement known as Orientalism and she superimposes the image of supermodel Naomi Campbell. You can see even in the lower legs here um, and in the arms that that historical imagery is coming through. And like Thomas, Lala Asadi looks to art history and particularly Orientalist paintings to formulate her compositions. Orientalism began in the mid 19th century following the European conquest of North Africa and the Middle East. European artists often traveled to the region and created scenes or portraits of the local community, but it was all for the purpose of showcasing the exotic rather than authentically capturing the culture. An example of this, of course, would be the Grand Odalis. And this is perhaps one of the most famous paintings of this time period, and it exemplifies just how fictitious Orientalist works could be. This artist in particular never traveled to North Africa or the Middle East. But even if he did, he would have never seen the subject of his painting, an odalisque, uh, which is historically a female concubine or slave. So he's composing this figure, this pose, this entire scene, all from his imagination, which is also why this woman is anatomically incorrect in so many ways. I mean, you have this extremely long back, uh, these legs, again, they just don't work in reality. <laughs> Um, but this artist was not alone in his approach. Many Orientalist artists um, never even visited the countries that they painted. Instead, scenes of carpet vendors, veiled women, even snake charmers, like this composition, were all crafted in the Western imagination of what, these, what this region would be like. In 1978, cultural theorist Edward Said argued that Orientalist ideology and imagery was not only an art and literary period, but a political tool used to generalize and misrepresent North Africa and the Middle East. And this is certainly the stance that many contemporary art historians and artists alike have on Orientalism. And addressing the issues created by Orientalism is one of the driving forces for Asadi's practice. Through appropriating the compositions that once misrepresented and objectified Arab women, Asadi is reclaiming authority and autonomy. And as we'll see, uh, her work begins to function as a revisionist history. This may also be a familiar work uh, for those in the audience. It was on view a few years ago. This is Super Blue Omo 
And this artist is a Nigerian-born artist who has lived and worked in the United States since the age of 16. In this scene, she's recalling a moment from her childhood in Nigeria. So the advertisement that you see playing on the television is actually um, for a laundry detergent <laughs> for a brand called Omo, which of course is what she's referencing in the title. And then throughout the scene, you see that she's screen printed um, imagery and that she's pulled from Nigerian newspapers and family photographs. In speaking on her art, the artist says, my art addresses my internal tension between my deep love for Nigeria, my country of birth, and my strong appreciation of Western culture, which has profoundly influenced both my life and my art. And it is in the same vein of illuminating the immigrant experience that we discover another undercurrent um, that directs Asadi's work. So Lala Asadi was born in 1956 in Morocco, and that country actually gained its independence that same year, ending a reign of French colonial rule. She grew up in a traditional conservative Muslim household. During high school, she left Morocco for Paris to complete her studies, and later moved to Saudi Arabia with her spouse, where she raised her family. And then in the 1990s, she actually returns back to Paris. This time, she begins to study painting and drawing at the School of Fine Arts. Following that, she earned her BA and MFA in painting and photography from Tufts University in Boston. And ever since that MFA degree conferral in 2003, Asadi has been producing images just like those uh, we have on view in the special exhibition. Her personal experience as an immigrant um, who often visits her home country uniquely poises her to offer a commentary on the complex reality of Arab female identity in the contemporary sense. But of course, when we say things like the complex reality of Arab female identity, what exactly do we mean? Well, Asadi often describes feeling too Eastern for the West and too Western for the East, almost not fitting into either culture, although she's lived in, in numerous places over her life. So already we have two themes represented in Asadi's work, one being the act of revisiting stereotypes, revising them from the art history, and then on the other hand, the immigrant experience. But there's one more vitally important puzzle piece, um, and it's the calligraphy that you see throughout all of her works. So in her photos, the sitter's skin and at times their surroundings are covered in Islamic calligraphy, which is applied with henna. Traditionally, calligraphy was only taught to men in Islamic cultures, whereas henna was seen as the women's craft. So what she's doing here is elevating the significance of the henna practice, celebrating its rich history and connection to women, but also kind of subverting the idea that only men can learn and communicate through calligraphy. And although her writing is not easily translated, because it's often free flow poetry, one brave art historian and curator took on the challenge, and I wanted to share that with you today. So in 2014, Isabel Brielmeyer translated just a selection of calligraphy from the Converging Territory series. And Asadi writes, the story began to be written the moment the present began. I am asking, how can I be simultaneously inside and outside? I didn't even know this world existed. I thought it existed only in my head, in my dreams. And now here I am, an open book. I am staring at the book and not sure what language I am supposed to speak. When a book is translated, it loses something in the process. And what am I but generations of translations? Um, so just want to revisit this to share that Asadi is applying all of that henna by hand, uh, which you can imagine is a very, very tedious process, um, but also a deeply personal one and an intimate one. Um, so just showing here those uh, shots up close where she's truly covering um, all parts, all visible parts of her sitter's skin. So it's through the henna calligraphy that we find the third thread of Asadi's body of work. As she celebrates Arab traditions like henna, she's also addressing issues faced by Arab women in the Eastern world. <coughs> and while this calligraphy is in the photographs, again, it's very hard to translate. Um, and so within the space, we felt it was very important to actually have the artist's voice come through beyond the images and uh, the writing in them. So we included the following quote. My photographs are about the women's subjects' participation in contributing to the greater emancipation of Arab women, 
while at the same time conveying to an outside audience a very rich tradition of practice, relationships, and ideas that are so often misunderstood and misrepresented in the West. And all combined, it is within these uh, broader context of this critique of the East and the West in the historical aspect and in the present day that Asadi's images and her presentation of Arab femininity are most pronounced and impactful. But now to the art itself. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, this show features four of Asadi's major series um, and over a decade of her practice. And in each photograph, she's staging very intricate and intimate portraits um, in various parts of her hometown of Marrakesh, Morocco. I think it's worth noting too that uh, the women in each of these images are either family or family friends um, who have spent months with Asadi um, beforehand to cultivate a, a closer relationship not only to each other but to the concepts that we had just discussed. So that first major series, Converging Territories, on screen here is where Asadi revisits childhood spaces, including her childhood home. In speaking about this series, Asadi reflected that in order to understand the woman I had become, I needed to re-encounter the child I once was. So these works represent that personal reflective journey that she embarked on um, through her customary veil, in her, um, in her conservative household, to her apparel. So those would be shoes there and the veil. And the work you see on the right, um, sorry that that's kind of looking a little blurry there. Um, it's actually part of a larger quadriptych where, where Asadi is showing four women at different stages of their lives, seamlessly veiling more or unveiling until you cannot see the woman's face at all. So there's this lingering discourse of what adulthood and maturity um, traditionally meant for a woman's outward expression. And again, um, that same ex excerpt of writing shared by Asadi was from this series. Um, and you can really tell how introspective and reflective the series was for the artist. Um, on to the next series. So the next series in this show is Les Femmes du Maroc, um, which translates to the women of Morocco. Um, and Asadi turns away from that inward reflection to address more directly the stereotypes imposed on Arab women through Orientalism. Again, Orientalism, as we discussed earlier, was that art movement which led to the objectification of Arab men and women beginning in the 19th century. And even the French title of this series is symbolic of Asadi looking back at the history of the region, um, and particularly her home country of Morocco, uh, because of course we were just mentioning that in 1956 there was the ending of French colonial rule. Um, and in many of these works, she has appropriated the exact composition of an earlier Orientalist works, work and uh, makes it her own. The most pronounced comparison really is um, this work, The Women of Algiers by Delacroix. And so you'll see the poses here are the exact same for all four women. Their gazes are also the same. Um, but in Asadi's composition, she removes all of the exotic-like features of the background, all of the props, the, you know, the hookah, the gold slippers that were inaccurately um, associated with the Arab world. But Delacroix's influence in the 19th century popular culture cannot be understated. Uh, this particular work on the right was exhibited in the 1834 Salon in Paris and soon after acquired by the French monarchy, which is quite the achievement. <laughs> So his painting was a celebrated contemporary work uh, for the time, but it neglected to portray the reality of Arab women um, and the significance of the private space. But rather it plays into that Western fantasy that we spoke about before. Um, in fact, Paul Cezanne once said that the vibrant colors in this painting, quote, enter the eye like a glass of wine running into your gullet and makes you drunk straight away, end quote. So in removing all of that background decor, all of those colors uh, that Cezanne is speaking to, um, Asadi attempts to show the composition void of the Western male gaze. And she does the same again, as I mentioned, throughout the rest of La Femme du Maroc. Um, so when women in Orientalist paintings, as we would see here, are shown in the nude, um, she's reclothing them and as a result, redirecting our gaze elsewhere. 
This work in particular reminds me of the snake charmers, uh, with this inclusion of an animal um, that is being tamed by a young boy, although this dove is kind of breaking away. In the final two bodies of work featured in the show, um, Asadi produces two parts of each, an original and then what she classifies as the revisited. So the first I will share is Harem, um, which was photographed not in a studio like before or a childhood home, uh, but on site at Dar el Basha, uh, which is a palace in Morocco. And so this is just an exterior view of that palace. And Harem marks Asadi's uh, shift to addressing the historical significance of the built environment and the architecture, rather than the imaginary that kind of laid at the foundation of Orientalism. So a little bit more about this palace. Um, it served as a palace beginning in 1912, uh, when Morocco was still under French colonial rule. And it was kind of a common place for lavish parties. Uh, there was a sizable harem, uh, which we'll get into, that attracted internationally known figures, um, such as Winston Churchill, Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> to name a few. But Asadi intentionally selected this location, um, which is now a national museum, to further engage with landmarks of Moroccan um, identity. So this location and the subsequent series um, also serves as an important turning point for the artist as she began to reconsider Morocco as her current home. It was no longer a place of her past, but where she was going to make her future. So in this series, Asadi is reshaping how an audience interacts with the harem, which was traditionally a sacred part of the Muslim household, reserved for women, and is deeply rooted in family traditions. It is a space that mothers, daughters, sisters can rule and have full autonomy over. But with Orientalism, that foundation was skewed, um, and the harem was inaccurately portrayed as an area of confinement, isolation, punishment, um, and at sometimes there was a, a sexual nature applied to it. So here we see Asadi's reestablishing the traditional meaning for the space, that the harem is an intimate private space for women. Asadi no longer camouflages her subjects with layers of fabric adorned with that henna, but instead she looks to the physical architecture. So the patterns on the clothing are replicas of this tile, Again, another tedious process um, that she would have gone through, months and months of preparation. But as she matches the clothing to the tile, um, she's almost making the women one with their surroundings. And in the artist's view, um, her sitters meld into these highly patterned uh, spaces, not because they are simply decorative or that they're the possession of somebody, but because they represent um, the foundation of the traditional meaning of the harem. And the harem is not for an outsider's um, consumption. You know, it's not for us to see what is happening. But again, these intimate spaces um, that are reserved for women. And I also just wanted to note that uh, in the exhibition design, we took great inspiration from the series. So as you'll see, there's some of that pattern um, in the corners of the room. And I really do invite you to go um, see the space after this talk. So Saudi continues her exploration into the contemporary definition of the domestic space um, in Harem Revisited. So here she's layering her sitter's uh, kaftans, which are the dresses, in unorthodox ways as she continues to reject outside expectations of Arab women. Um, normally these, these dresses would have been used for birthdays or other celebratory um, events, but here it's just kind of an everyday um, application. And this is also the first moment uh, where we see Asadi really explore color boldly, um, and she does it beautifully. Um, the artist once noted that this series is inspired by her personal love of fashion, and I can only imagine that living in Eastern and Western cultures um, and countries exposed her to a wide range of fashion. And a curator should never ever have favorites, but I must share that these are among uh, the works I enjoy the most. So through the first part of that series, Harem, Asadi's work is rooted in recontextualizing history. Whereas the second part, Harem Revisited, begins to symbolically define the future of Arab women in the private space. 
The final series in the exhibition that's on view um, is Bullets, and the subsequent continuation of the series is Bullets Revisited. So here, Asani looks more to current events of the Arab world, particularly gun violence, violence against women, and rebellion, um, especially in the wake of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was a series of anti-government protests, uprisings, and armed rebellions that spread across much of the Arab world in the early 2010s. And while Arab women were at the forefront of that movement, um, they were still subject to violence um, and assaults, both publicly and pri privately. So what's really fascinating is that in each of these works, um, each circle that you see is a bullet casing. So you can imagine the time that it took just to collect these casings, cut them, weave them together for the fabric. And actually, she sourced her um, bullets from shooting ranges in the state of Georgia. So imagine that, actually, <laughs> going through the airport. You have this artist on your flight, and she has just bags of bullet casings. <laughs> um, but the resulting garments um, were often hundreds of pounds, uh, almost serving as kind of an armor for these women. Um, Asadi still veils her sitters in various ways, um, and she's highlighting that treatment of uh, women as objects to be covered or protected. And again, like I mentioned, that she did source those casings from Georgia, um, and that's another way she's connecting back to that commentary of critiquing the West, um, really beginning to facilitate a dialogue around Western participation in violence across the Middle East. Um, and so I know this is a very short presentation, but I really want to encourage you guys to go um, see the exhibition as well and just experience the work. And in closing, I'd like to share just one final quote from Asadi um, that illuminates her passion and the driving forces for her work. She says, a lot of people ask me why I choose to dwell on this issue. The issue being Orientalism, the issue being um, the dialogue between East and West. And it's because it's not solved. It may not be the odalisk now, but the odalisk is what later became the veiled female figure. If we don't unveil that founding myth first, we cannot begin to address the rest. And this is also a quote that I saw early on in our um, exploration of Asadi's work um, and where I got the inspiration of the title of the show from. So both beautiful and self-possessed, the women in Asadi's photographs are not only connected to their past, but they will also help to shape their future. They are not uh, the women of Orientalist eyes. They're not the women of Algiers that Delacroix represented. They're not the women of a male fantasy. Um, instead, they are unveiling the reality of women in Morocco. Thank you all. Thank you.